Well, hey, welcome to First Church. So glad you guys are joining us for worship here today. If you're new, my name's Chad. Welcome, and I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be here every Sunday. Hopefully, you guys are pumped to be here as well. I know we have a whole bunch of people joining us online right now, and I just checked. We've got Crystal in Collinsville, Cynthia in Alabama, Keith, who's on duty at his fire station right now, joining us for worship, Amber, who's sick at home with some family members, or she has some family members sick at home. Sorry about that. Praying for you guys. Barbara out in California, and a whole bunch of others. So if you are in the room, Would you get loud, put your hands together, welcome in our online family. Let them know we are excited. They are worshiping with us also. And as you guys know by now, we are just two weeks away from our annual Your Invited series. I cannot wait. It's going to be awesome. We announced our themes last week. And so we're going to kick off our Your Invited series with Tailgate Sunday, then Cookout Sunday the next week. Remember, that's our t-shirt giveaway Sunday. You got to be on site to get a t-shirt, but that's Labor Day weekend, Jurassic Sunday, Carnival Sunday. It's going to be awesome. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, You're Invited was the first time that we ever visited First Church. And then they came here and they got involved, plugged in, and the rest is history. So on your seats today, we have these Your Invited Invite cards. Take some with you. We've got plenty out in the uh, the gathering space as well. You can get a whole bunch of them. Invite your friends because we want our our community to see what God is doing in this place. And like I said, it's going to be an incredible time together over that four-week period. But I'm also excited today because we're in week two of our series, Go For Gold. And I'm not sure if you've had the chance to watch much of the Olympics this year, but there was this heartwarming moment that happened this past week. It happened in women's swimming. I'm not sure if you saw this, but Katie Ledecky, who's like known for being the GOAT of USA Women's Swimming, I mean, she's just incredible. She's won a ton of medals, ton of gold medals. And this week she won the women's 1500 meter freestyle. And this was her right afterwards. She's pointing to the crowd as she got out of the pool waving and whatever and everybody's celebrating and cheering and they're all excited for her and then Katie caught the eye of a little girl a little fan in the stands that was waving at her and so she so Katie waved directly at her, and I loved the reaction of this little girl. Take, she's just so pumped that Katie Ledecky noticed her. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, there were sports heroes that I looked up to, and I saw a clip of this little girl being interviewed, and she said, the little girl, she said, I want to be just like Katie when I grow up. That little girl, she swims now, and she said, I want to win an Olympic medal just like Katie. We probably all growing up had heroes, people that we looked up to, that we wanted to be like. And it's not just when we grow up as adults, we have heroes too. In fact, in the early 90s, the Gatorade company had this advertising campaign. Some of you may be old enough to remember this, Be Like Mike. And the whole point of the advertising campaign was if you drank the same sports drink that Michael Jordan drinks, then you could dunk a ball like him, you know, a basketball like him. Let me just tell you something. I tried it. It doesn't work. Okay, but still, Gatorade sold a whole lot of their product because... A lot of people want to be like or wanted to be like Mike. And so I just want to ask you the question as we get started today, who do you most want to be like? Because we all want to be like somebody. We all have people who we look up to, we idolize, who we want to be like, we want to emulate in life. But who do you most want to be like? I know what you might be thinking. Okay, Chad, We're at church. We know the answer you're looking for. I mean, it's Jesus, right? We get it. We're at church. No secret there. It kind of reminds me of the old joke I heard years ago of this teacher who was teaching children's church on a Sunday morning, and she had a bunch of little kids in the room, and the teacher asked the kids, what is small and furry and brown and lives in the woods and gathers nuts and climbs trees? And none of the kids answered. They were quiet, which was unusual. And so the teacher asked again, he said, you guys know the answer. This is not that hard. What's small and furry and brown and lives in the woods and climbs trees, gathers nuts, and still silence. None of the kids in children's church answered. And so finally the teacher said, come on, somebody's got to answer. You guys know the answer. And this little girl put her hand up very slowly and the teacher called on her. And the little girl said, uh, I want to say a squirrel, but since we're at church, I'll say Jesus. You know, and I get that, right? Because when you're in church, Jesus is always the answer, right? We know that. So when I say, who do you most want to be like? You probably know the answer that I'm looking for. So maybe we need to ask a deeper question. If Jesus is the answer, then is that answer really consistent with how we live? Do we show in our daily actions 
in our daily behavior, in our conversations, that Jesus is who we really want to be like. Because like I said last week, I believe the church in our culture today is facing a crisis where it has become perfectly acceptable for people to claim to be Christians and not live like Jesus. And it's okay, it's accepted in our church culture today. And let me ask you, is it possible that we have settled for a wildly insufficient version of Christianity where people can claim to be Christians, publicly claim to be Christians, without actually living like Christ? Because if that's the case, then we've lost our way. And that's the whole point of this series, Go for Gold. We want to rediscover the way of Jesus. Because before we get to our Your Invited series and we invite all these guests to come and worship with us and experience the presence of God in this place, we want to make sure that we're focused on the right thing. We want to make sure as a church that we are aiming at the right goal. Because you see, this phrase, go for gold, it's an athletic phrase. You've probably heard it a lot during the Olympics, but it just means aim for the highest result. Aim for the highest goal. And I wonder if in the church today, if maybe we at times have been aiming for goals that are far less than the highest goal, far less than the goal that God wants us to aim for. Because no athlete gets to this point in life where they're standing on the platform wearing a gold medal. No one gets to that point by accident. They train and they prepare for years, put in a bunch of practice and they have a goal in mind and they're focused And they do everything they possibly can to get to this point. No one wins an Olympic gold medal by accident. And it's interesting that in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us that this is an analogy, an illustration for our spiritual lives, for our spiritual development. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 3.14. We looked at this verse last week. Paul uses athletic imagery and he says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What's Paul saying? I don't run around aimlessly. I don't live life without purpose. Paul says, I have something in life that I am aiming for. And what he's trying to let us know that as followers of Jesus, the same should be true for us. We should be aiming for something. And last week we looked in Philippians chapter 3 where Paul tells us what we should be aiming for. That Jesus is the goal, the goal of life. And it's not that, yeah, Jesus is the goal, Jesus is the church answer. No, Jesus is the goal. He is what life is all about. He is the purpose and the meaning of life. And unless he is the ultimate goal of your life, you may exist, but you will never really live. He is how you live. A full, satisfied, content life. He is the goal. Paul says, I want to know him more and I want to live like him. That's the goal. And the thing is, Paul was writing that after being a Christian for years. Because Paul says, this is the goal we have every single day. The longer we know Jesus, the more we should start to look and act like him. That's why here at First Church, our mission statement is simple. It's love Jesus, love like Jesus. And this is true for every person who claims to be a follower of Jesus. We first want to be a church. And we're not going to apologize for this. We want To be a church where everyone loves Jesus, meaning we live in a daily relationship with him and we grow in our relationship with him on a daily basis so that we love him more and more and more. And that should be true for you whether you were baptized today or whether you became a Christian 50 years ago. We may be at different points on this spiritual journey, but we're all headed in the same place and that is in the direction of Jesus. And the more that we love Jesus, the more we will do the second part of our mission statement, which is he will rub off on us and we will love like Jesus. Now we get it. We're not gonna do this perfectly because none of us are perfect, but that's the goal. That's what we are aiming for because Jesus didn't come just so that we could accept some truths about him, some intellectual truths. He came to give us a new way of life. 
That's why in Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus says this, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to come after me, whoever wants to be part of my movement, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, in other words, give up their old way of life and take up their cross daily and follow me. Now, what's Jesus saying here? Is he saying that our salvation is in jeopardy daily, that depending on how good we are day by day depends on whether or not we're saved? No, that's not what Jesus is saying at all. See, when we receive Jesus as Lord, we are fully justified in God's sight. God declares us righteous in his sight. And so we can stand before God in confidence knowing that the grace of Jesus has made us right with God. But even though we have been declared righteous by God, we still live in sinful bodies. We still live in a world that's been corrupted by sin. And so because of that, we should wake up every single day with the goal, we want to be more like Jesus. And the more that we surrender our life to him, the more that we allow for him to lead us and coach us and prepare us for life, the more we will look like him. That's what Jesus here is saying. And this, the word, and this word disciple, I get it. It's kind of a churchy word. We talked about that last week too. It's not a word that we use all the time in our everyday language. I mean, for you students who are going back to school here in Owasso this week, I'm sorry to bring that up, but you guys know what's coming, right? I mean, I doubt if you're gonna be talking with some of your friends and be like, hey, who's discipling you today? I mean, that's not a word that we use a whole lot, but it's a really, it's a word that everybody in Jesus' day and age would have known very well. It just means to apprentice under someone. See, those words follow me it means come and be like me. Come and apprentice under me. It, those were the words that a rabbi would tell his student when he thought that student was worthy enough to carry on his trade and carry on his character and carry on his way of life. And so the rabbi would turn to a student and say, follow me. And that student would give up everything that they knew to now follow the rabbi, live with the rabbi, observe the rabbi and eventually duplicate the rabbi's way of life. And that's what Jesus is saying when he says, follow me. See, Jesus isn't seeking acceptance. Jesus is seeking apprentices, people who will do life with him and like him. And like I said, I know discipleship is a churchy word, but it just means the process of duplication. It's becoming like the one we choose to follow. It's becoming like our teacher. And that's what it means to go for gold. Anything else, if your goal is not to be like Jesus, to know him better and to live like him, then you are following a goal that is far less than what God wants for your life. See, this is what God wants for us. Listen to Romans chapter eight. You've probably heard these words before, at least the first part, but the second part is what I wanna emphasize. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. He appointed them to be saved in keeping with his purpose. God planned that those he had chosen would what? Become like his son. See, that verse is not saying that if you follow God, then everything in your life will be good. It is saying that no matter what you experience, no matter what you go through in life, God can use it to achieve his ultimate good. And what is his ultimate good for you? For you to be shaped into the image of his son. For you to be like Jesus. That's going for gold. That's what God wants for you and for me. But here's the key. This doesn't happen by accident. No one drifts into Christ's likeness. We have to be intentional about it. We have to be willing to surrender ourselves to Jesus daily for him to transform us, for him to shape us. Because whether we realize it or not, all of us are being discipled by someone or something. All of us are being discipled by someone or something. Listen to what Romans chapter 12 says. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, you are either going to conform to the image of this world, or you're going to be transformed by Jesus. The choice is ours and all of us are being discipled by something. 
You may, you may be being discipled right now by the TV shows you watch or the music that you listen to or the people that you hang out with or the hobbies that you participate in. Social media shapes us, disciples us. Political agendas shape us. They disciple us. Our work culture, our school culture, our teen culture, the podcast we listen to, all of these things are trying to shape us. And there are thousands of voices in our culture today, all competing for our attention, all telling us that they know how to do life best. And at the end of your life, your heart will break if you have been following another voice other than Jesus's voice. Because the only path of discipleship that leads to real life lasting life, eternal life is the path of Jesus. And that's why Jesus says in John chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. All those other paths out there, they just want to destroy your life. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. If you really want to live both now and in the life to come, you got to live the Jesus-shaped way of life. Following him is the only path that matters. And so here at First Church, we are not ashamed to say that we are simply followers of Jesus that help other people follow Jesus. That's why we're here. And if we ever become anything other than that, then we've lost our way. And so what we're trying to do in this series is help one another understand what it means to grow as followers of Jesus. And what we will learn as we look at the life of Jesus is this, community is crucial for spiritual growth. Now, do you know who the person is who knows how to follow Jesus the best? Jesus, that's where you answer Jesus, okay? That's the right answer, okay? It's Jesus. The person who knows how to be a disciple of Jesus the best is Jesus. And when you actually look at the life of Jesus, what you discover is Jesus trained followers in the community. See, Jesus calls us to follow him as individuals, but he doesn't call us to go solo in life. Doing life together is how Jesus discipled people. And as followers of Jesus, we don't just belong to Jesus, we belong to his movement as well. I want you to pay careful attention to what Paul says to Titus. Paul writes these words, Jesus Christ gave himself for us for a purpose. And this is the purpose that Jesus gave himself up for. Are you ready? To redeem us from all wickedness, to save us basically from our sin, right? And there's two parts to this purpose. And to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what's good in this world. Did you catch that? Why did Jesus go to the cross? Why did Jesus pay the price of our sin? One, to make us holy before God, but two, so that he could have a people who are his very own, who represent him in this world, eager to advance his good in this world. And I think sometimes we lose sight of the second part of that. We're all about the individual salvation that we receive, and we should celebrate that. But we forget that when we, when we receive Jesus as Lord, it's not just that we belong to him, we belong to his movement. We're part of his family. We're part of his community on earth. And because of that, we are a colony of heaven in the midst of a corrupt world. We represent him. We are light in the midst of darkness. And it's a huge responsibility that Jesus has given us. But it's also a huge honor and privilege. Because you see, God has always wanted a family. From the very beginning, what has God wanted? He has wanted children who would reflect him, who would reflect his image, children who would live according to his character and his way of life. God has always wanted a family. And we, time and time again, have rebelled against that. What God wants for us but what Jesus has done, Jesus has come and provided us a way in the midst of our rebellion to come back to God so that God can have the family, the people that he has always wanted, the people who are his very own. And here's the thing, it's not just that God wants a family. God knows we need a family. 
We need to be part of a family because this world at times is a really, really tough place to live. The days are sometimes really, really difficult, aren't they? And we need others around as a community, a family that will help us during this journey that we call life. That's why in Hebrews chapter 10, the New Testament says this, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Hit pause right there. Even in the first century, these early Christians, people were skipping church. Get that? And that's what the New Testament is saying here. Don't give up meeting together. Some people are doing it. Don't do it. And here's why. But let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. One day we will be united with Jesus in a full and complete way. But right now, we need one another to encourage us so that we get to that day. We need one another to support us, to stir us when we feel stagnant, to challenge us when we need to be challenged, to wake us up when we need to be woke up. We need others around us to help us in this life that we're living right now. So whether you like it or not, the Bible is repeatedly teaching us that discipleship is a team sport. We need one another. The church, and, by, and when I say church, I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about just what we do here on Sunday mornings. But the church, as in the community of Jesus' followers, the church is essential for our spiritual development. And it's essential to God's plan to rescue the world. Now here's the thing. I don't know if we always see the church as essential. I think sometimes in our American culture, we see the church as just something we check off a list. It's like, okay, I, I gotta pray. I gotta read my Bible. Gotta give to the offering. Gotta go to church. Check, check, check. It's just something we check off. And I think that's exactly what our enemy wants. See, our enemy wants us to see church, the community of believers, our enemy wants us to see church as an option rather than something that is essential to our spiritual lives. If you don't believe me, why is it that Satan tries every chance he, every chance he gets to make worshiping together as Christians illegal across the globe? You can go to country after country across the globe today where it is illegal to worship Christ together. Why is it that Satan is trying to stop God's people from coming together in worship, coming together in fellowship? Because Satan, our enemy, knows just how powerful it is when God's people are united together. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says in 1 Corinthians 5, 4, when you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, the power of our Lord Jesus is present. In other words, when God's people, when followers of Jesus come together as one, Jesus' power is present there in a way that it is not at other times when the church is not gathered. You see, it's not that Jesus isn't present everywhere. He is. He is God. He is omnipresent. I get that. But Jesus is uniquely present in a special, powerful way when God's people come together. He is present in a way that he is not present at other times when the church is not gathered together. And Satan doesn't want us accessing that power. Satan doesn't want us using that power. Satan wants to keep us as powerless as he possibly can. And that's why he's always attacking Christian worship. So I think we need to think differently when it comes to community. See, I think I've been a little bit wrong in the past, not intentionally, but I have talked about community, Christian community, church community in the past, as just a step in the discipleship process. You know, if you wanna be a disciple of Jesus, then you need to do this, this, and this, community being one of those things. Again, it's just a checklist of things that you do. And I think I'm wrong on that. As I've been reading scripture recently, it's hit me. Community is not something we do. It's not a step that we take in the discipleship process. Instead, community is the environment in which spiritual growth takes place. It's the environment that fosters and cultivates spiritual growth. The environment that fosters and cultivates discipleship. 
It's not just a step we take as if, okay, I met with my small group this week. Check, I did my community part of being a follower of Jesus. That's not what community is. It's the environment that fosters spiritual growth. Now I get it. When you hear that, some of you, you put your head down because you've experienced some real church hurt. And the church has not always been that type of community for you. Right now, there may be people watching online who are not present in person because they've been burnt by the church in the past. And even though they know the gospel is still important and they know the church is still important, they just can't step foot back in a church yet because of past church hurt. I get that. And I just wanna let you know today, if you've been hurt by the church in the past, the first thing I wanna say is I'm sorry. I'm sorry that sometimes churches get focused on the wrong goals and they aim for the wrong things and they try to chase after personal preferences and they get caught up in power struggles and they get more focused on problems than they do the promises of God. I'm sorry that that happens and I know it does and I'm there with you. I've been hurt by the church in the past too. You may think, well, you're a preacher. Yeah, preachers get hurt by the church too. And so first of all, I just wanna say I'm sorry, if that's you. Second of all, I wanna say, I'm glad you're here. We've been told by people before that they've come to First Church after being hurt by their last church and First Church has been a place for them to heal and recoup and find restoration and that's awesome and if we can do that for you, we definitely wanna do that for you. But I also wanna say this, just because other people have abused the church or misused the church or have missed what's most important in the church, It's not a reason for us to give up on the church. You know why? You know why the mindset, I love the church, I mean, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. People say that sometimes. People say, you know, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. You know why that mindset won't work? Because Jesus loves the church. And how can you love Jesus and not love what he loves? Look at what Paul writes or what Paul says to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. Feed and care for the church of God. He bought it with his own blood. Did you catch that? See, Jesus died so that the church could exist. And if Jesus purchased the church with his own blood, gave up his life so that his people, the church, could exist, then we need to be all in when it comes to the church. The church is not... An addendum, it's not something extra, it's not a parenthesis. It is the vehicle, the instrument that Jesus established to change the world. And because of that, we need to restore the glory and significance of the church because if we do not see the church as Jesus sees it, the world around us is going to suffer because of it. Now here's the thing, I know at times the church is gonna be messy. And I know that even in this church, there may be somebody who down the road offends you or gives you a bad look and, or maybe somebody who does something that you don't agree with, I get that. We've all been hurt before by the church. But you know why the church is messy at times? Because people are messy. I'm messy and you're messy. And the reason why there's not a perfect church anywhere on earth is because there are no perfect Christians. Let me just see, show of hands. Anybody in here a perfect Christian? My hand's not up, okay? Anybody a perfect Christian? If you're raising your hand, we need to talk later, okay? None of us are perfect. And if none of us perfectly represent Jesus in this world, why in the world would we expect a church to be perfect? See, we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners in desperate need of God's grace. And that's why we need the church. And I think we need to understand that discipleship is a process. It's not instant. When somebody arrives from the waters of baptism, they don't immediately start to love like Jesus. They don't immediately start to act like Jesus. It's a process. And we're all at different phases in the process. And we're all gonna have bad days and we're all gonna have rough seasons. And it's a process. Jesus continues to work on us. And sometimes it's three steps forward for me and two steps back. You guys are there too, I know. But when we start realizing it's a process for everyone, ourselves included, maybe we will show other people the grace that we want them to show us. Maybe we will start to show others the grace that we want God to show us. So let me say this. 
We here at First Church, we will never be a church that loves like Jesus perfectly. So just get that out of your mind. But we can be a church that loves like Jesus purposefully. Now that's good. That deserves an amen right there, honestly, okay? See, let me say it again in case you missed it. Write this down, put it in your phone, put it up on Twitter, X, whatever it's called now. Okay, this is good, all right? If I don't say so myself. We will never be a church that loves like Jesus perfectly, but we can be a church that loves like Jesus purposefully. We may not do that perfectly, but that can be our purpose. That can be our goal. And when we start to accept that the Christian community will be messy, then we will realize that that's exactly why we need it. And just because it's messy doesn't mean it's not necessary. And here's why. First of all, we grow. We grow by loving. Like I said, when you first accept Jesus as Lord, you don't instantly start loving like him. Our definition of love has been, well, shaped by the world around us. And the world tells us that we love those who love us in return. The world's definition of love is you love those who deserve it. You love those who have earned it. You love those who do things for you. You love those who love you. But Jesus has a radically different definition of love. In Luke chapter 6, he says this. He says, treat others as you want them to treat you. Do you think that you deserve credit for merely loving those who love you? Even the godless do that. Jesus says, you love people who love you back? Everybody does that. Jesus is giving us a new definition of love. And he says that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. We're supposed to do that every day in real life. And you know how we learn to do that? By doing it first in the church. Because in the church, we are going to be surrounded by people who aren't like us. People who look different than us. People who come from different backgrounds, social, economics, racial backgrounds than us. People who think differently than us. We are, we are going to be surrounded by people who are different than us. I mean, right now, you may be sitting beside somebody who you would have never met if it wasn't for the fact that you were both committed to the church, right? Committed to Jesus. The church is made up of people who are different. And that's okay because our common commitment to Jesus brings us together and we learn to love people that are different than us. Because Jesus calls us to love real people, not just ideal people. He calls us, he calls us to love real people. Think about the first disciples that Jesus ever called. I mean, there's this guy named Matthew. Remember him? He was a tax collector. He worked for the Roman government. The Jews considered him a sellout in their day to the Roman government. And then Jesus also called another guy named Simon the Zealot. But the fact that he was called Simon the Zealot meant that he was part of a group that protested the government establishment. So in these original 12 disciples, who does Jesus put side by side? A guy who worked for the government and a guy who protested the government. And they lived day in and day out together. And most people were probably thinking, Jesus, that ain't gonna fly. That's not gonna work out. But why did Jesus do it? Knowing that those two people did not see eye to eye on everything. Because it's a picture of the gospel. See, what brings us together is not our commonality. What brings us together is not that we are perfectly compatible with everybody we worship with. What brings us together is our commitment to Jesus. It's like in a marriage. If you've ever had the chance to get to know my wife, you know she is very different from me. And that's okay, that's a good thing. I would hate to be married to somebody just like me. That would be the worst, honestly, if I was married to somebody just like me. But if you've ever got to know her, you know, people tell me all the time, you and Allison are so different. Yep. And we don't always agree on everything. We don't always see eye to eye on everything. We don't share everything in common when it comes to our interests. But you know why? Over 16 years, I feel like I know her much better today than I did 16 years ago and why our marriage is healthy right now at this point and why we continue to grow closer to one another. It's not because we have everything in common. It's because we're committed to one another because there are rough days in a marriage. And during those rough days, if all you have is what you have in common, you're gonna be in trouble. But if you're committed to one another, you can get through those rough patches together. The same should be true for the church. We don't meet here because we agree with everyone here on every issue. We meet here together because we are committed to Jesus and he is our focus. We will never live like Jesus if we refuse to allow him to stretch our capacity to love. Second, Christian community is necessary because we're stronger together. Two are better than one. We we know this, but when we surround ourselves with godly people, they help us see what we can't see. I have up here with me today a convex mirror 
And if you know how these work, you know, they're shaped, they're rounded in such a way to where you can see a wider angle. You can see more than what you can see in just a normal mirror. If you go to any convenience store or, you know, shop around town, you will probably see these in the corners of the room because they help, they help people see what's typically a blind spot. In fact, I went to Walmart just to try to buy one of these, and Walmart doesn't sell these. I mean, they sell them like you can put on your car, but not a big one like this one. And so I was asking them, they said, no, we don't sell those. But what's interesting is, even though they don't sell them, they have them everywhere in Walmart. You walk around Walmart, you will see these in every corner, you'll see it around every aisle, they're everywhere. Why? Because it allows for the employees of Walmart to see what they can't see on their own, around corners. Right? Allows them to see blind spots. And all of us have blind spots in life. And what we need are people who will help us see those blind spots, who will help us see the enemy coming when the enemy is attacking, who will help us see those temptations that we're struggling with and maybe we don't realize it yet, who will help us see danger when it's creeping around the corner, who will help us see what we need to see. That's why it's important to surround ourselves with godly people. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Translation, stuff rubs off. You hang out with fools, you're going to act like a fool. You hang out with wise people, you're going to act wise. Plus, when we hang out with people who model godly behavior, well, we get to combine our gifts and resources together for good. As 1 Corinthians says, it says in chapter 12, as it is, there are many parts, but one body, one church. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. We all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. And when we join those together, we become a powerful force. And that brings me to the last point that I want to make today. The Christian community is essential to Jesus' plan. See, we are the instrument, like I said, that Jesus has chosen to carry his name to the world. And I want you to notice what Jesus prayed right before he went to the cross. This is the night that Jesus was betrayed. And I want you to notice what Jesus prays to his Father before he goes to the cross to pay the sacrifice of all of mankind's sin. Jesus prays, may they, speaking of his future followers, his church, may they be brought to complete unity. Why? To let the world know that you, Father, sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Before Jesus goes to the cross to pay the price of our sin, before he is beaten and tortured, before he's betrayed, before he does any of that, before he goes to the cross of Calvary, what is on Jesus' mind? It's not a what, it's a who, and it's you and me. And he prayed for us, his future followers, to be one, to be united. Why? So that the world would believe. The salvation of the world hinges on the activity and the work of the church. See, we need to restore the glory and significance of God's church. If Jesus died for the church to exist, the church has got to be essential to our lives. And when we see the church as God's chosen instrument for introducing the world to his son, then what we will do is we will We will make sure that our church is grounded on the promises of Jesus rather than our own personal preferences. Sadly, so many churches do things based on personal preferences of people. People choose churches based on their personal preferences. And people say, hey, I go to that church because I like that style of music or I like the preacher or I like the programs or I like the location. The problem is that just creates a consumeristic mentality because any of those things can change at a moment's notice. Music styles change. Preachers leave. I'm not hinting at anything, but it happens. Preachers leave. Programs come and go. Locations even change when it comes to churches. And if you are simply choosing a church for consumeristic reasons, then you will abandon the church the moment that your preferences aren't met. And that's why here at First Church, we don't do what we do in order to meet the preferences of people. We do what we do in order to live out the promises of God. And when we stand on the promises of God, even if it's not what people always want, when we stand on the promises of God, then we believe what Jesus said about the church in Matthew chapter 16 will be fulfilled in our midst. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The world at its worst needs the church at its best. 
And there's a lot of darkness all around us right now, but people are hungry for what the church has and we need to live up to our calling. I had a conversation with one of our young adults this week who's in the room right now. He knows who he is. And I had lunch with him and he volunteers at a local prison occasionally. And he was telling me that he was sitting across from an inmate one time and the inmate found out that he went to first church here in Owasso. And that inmate said, that's my church. He's like, you been there? He's like, no, no, I watch online. I watch on TV all the time. That's my church. He said, I love Chad. I've never met this guy, but he loves me. Awesome, you know? He says, that's my church. I watch every week. And he's being fed week in and week out because of the gospel that we're preaching. Guys, people are hungry right now for the hope that is found in Jesus. And the only way they're gonna find that hope is if we, the church, have the right goal in mind. So let me ask you, how important is the church to you? How important is Christian community to you? Are you surrounding yourself with people who will help you live more like Jesus? Who do you really want to be like the most? Because if you want to be like Jesus, he teaches us that discipleship is a team sport. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be part of your church. And I pray that we will live out the calling that you have given to us, that we will show the world who your son is, and that by doing so, you will work in us to change lives. Father, the darkness is fleeing, and we pray that we can continue to run it out of the room by shining the light of Jesus in our midst. It's in the name of Jesus.